perhaps um, in however long is left uh, for this fellowship, be it, you know, maybe we'll get to the end of the three months and the Lord will say, no, that's it, or maybe we'll carry on. But obviously, question and answers are, are playing a part in it. Um, I'm sure that there'll be plenty of times when I come and I've got something prepared, uh, but there are going to be other times when question and answers do play a part in it. So perhaps sort of people could bear in mind that at any time, if, if you get a question that's nagging at you, to kind of jot it down and remember to bring it up. Because sort of sometimes I go to places. I mean like uh, on Sunday night, I did a question time somewhere where normally I only preach. Uh, you know, I'd done one once before and uh, about two years ago. And on Sunday night I said, right, we're going to have a question time. And people said, oh, there are loads of questions we've got we can't remember, you see. You know, and that as things go along, questions come up. So perhaps sort of start start chalking down any questions you've got so that uh, they can come up perhaps at a time like this. Um, I think tonight we'll probably do a question um, if anyone's got one that they'd like to ask. I'm just thinking about, you know, assuming that was of the Lord and we have to check all, all the prophecy, but what our <coughs> attitude ought to be towards sin. Um, to our, well, to, to other people's sin that we see much more clearly than our own. But, I mean, you can get indignant about sin, you get worked up about sin, sin generally in the country, sin in the people that you see. I, I don't know that we ought to discuss this or you ought to talk about it, but I just sort of make that point in case anyone's got an answer. We feel that's what, one thing that the Lord would have us talk about or think about. Yeah, yeah, right. Had anyone got anything else that was sort of perhaps burning away because if not we'll, we'll take it but, but that's the one um, I'm not sure how much I, I'd say on that I think to a certain extent the main thing that strikes me and that I'm aware of and in the word that you have the Lord emphasised that in fact we aren't aware how terrible sin is and um, I know that there are so many things that I know are wrong. I know they're sinful. But whether I take them seriously enough to sacrifice something, and whether I take it seriously enough to sacrifice my son, I'm sure I wouldn't. Now, all that demonstrates is that I, for one at any rate, don't really uh, realise mm. how terrible sin is. Yeah. Um, it, mm. It's... I mean, I suppose the thing about sin is that if one's going to home in on it, the very first thing to home in on is that in fact sin has been dealt with already. Mm. And that perhaps in some ways the thing that needs to be understood most, or I think the, the, the most deeply ingrained misunderstanding in Bible-believing Christians about sin, is quite simply this. Sin is terrible. Sin is the curse in the world. But we tend to propagate the idea that when someone gets converted, at the moment they're converted, their sins are taken away. Now, in fact, that isn't what the Bible teaches. Now, this may sound a bit radical to some, but I assure you it's perfectly normal Bible teaching, but it just doesn't seem to have come across. You see, we know that when Jesus died, there was only one reason he came. It was the sin thing. He came because he loved us. But Jesus would have still loved us if sin had never come into the world. So really, the only reason Jesus needed to come to die was because man had sinned, was separated from God. Now remember when John the Baptist witnessed to Jesus. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, it's a very good idea when reading the Bible to use the rule that you take it literally, unless there's some very, very good reason not to. So when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and we know full well that that was done when Jesus died, it means that 2,000 years ago, the sins of the world were taken away. And in the Old Testament, through prophets God spoke to Israel he said things to them such as that I will remove your transgressions 
from you as far as the east is from the west. And I mean, really, uh, you know, I mean, sort of uh, latest cosmology tends to show us that the universe, it's, it's a limited thing, certainly. But if a beam of light travels out in a straight line, after millions and millions of years, it will come back the other way. There's a lot to suggest that the universe itself is almost like a globe of space and matter. Therefore, the east from the west is an infinite sort of distance. It, it can't be calculated. And so therefore, we know that when Jesus died on the cross, sin was dealt with as thoroughly as that. All right, it was taken away completely. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, sin was no longer what kept man out of fellowship with God. Now, one of the things that you tend to notice through the preaching of Jesus is that whereas today we tend to home in on people's sins, and I mean, sins have got to be dealt with and repented of, obviously. But that's not so you can be forgiven in the sense of suddenly put right with God and have fellowship with Him. You don't repent of your sins so you can be born again. You believe on Jesus so you can be born again. But repentance from the act of sin is quite simply that once you're born again, you come into friendship with Jesus and you come to be a son of your father. But he's a father with standards. Therefore, if a son fails to reach his father's standards, the father starts to discipline him. Or if someone has a blazing row with somebody that you're close to, you can't then carry on as if it never happened. So the point about repentance from specific sins is that once we're born again, then we must repent to stay in fellowship with Father and with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. Now when Jesus spoke about being born again, he always spoke in terms of believing on him. If you turn to John chapter 3, and we'll see an example that there's a sense in which Jesus preached a different gospel sometimes to the one that we preach. And if you find John chapter 3, and I'm going to read from verse 16. And Jesus said this. <coughs> Remember all the time that Jesus came into the world to deal with sin. He did that when he died on the cross. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. This is an important bit. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now here is Jesus talking about people coming out of the condition of when they die they'll spend an eternity in the lake of fire into the condition of suddenly now they'll never perish but have everlasting life so Jesus here is talking about the step that a man takes in order to have eternal life to be born again and there's not one mention here of sin is there can you see that Jesus doesn't mention it at all all he mentions is believing in him. Now the reason is that when Jesus died he took away the sins of the world and the technical term for that is the atonement. When Jesus died on the cross everything that Adam brought upon the world, the sin that Adam brought into the world when he sinned, everything that was done at the fall of man was undone when Jesus died on the cross. Everything that was lost when Adam fell was restored, at least potentially, for anyone who believes in Jesus, once Jesus died on the cross. So therefore, before I became a Christian, I was separated from God, and if I died, I would have gone to hell. But I would not have gone to hell because I'd committed sins. 
the barrier between me and God before I was a Christian, and this applies to everyone in this world today, throughout history, the barrier between them and God is not their sin. Because on the cross, Jesus took it away. He bore it away. The sins of the world, past, present and future, were dealt with by Jesus on the cross. If it's true, say an unbeliever walks in here tonight, if I was to go up to him and I was to say, look, your sins are preventing you from being saved, then that would make a mockery of something that Jesus said on the cross. And Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. When Jesus died on the cross, he dealt with the sin issue. Therefore, <coughs> when Adam sinned, he brought a barrier between himself and God. Eve sinned, she was deceived. There was a barrier between her and God. Now, because the sinful nature <coughs> is passed on through the man, therefore, everyone who was born had a barrier of sin between them and God. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, the barrier was taken away. So, therefore, what we've got to ask is this. All right, if the barrier is now taken away, the barrier of sin, what is it that now keeps us from having fellowship with God without being born again. Now picture, if you like, this barrier that is between man and God before Jesus died. The barrier of sin. And it has lots of kinds of parts of it. I mean, firstly, man has positively sinned. All right, Therefore, the sin needs to be atoned for. On the other hand, in order to have fellowship with God, you've got to be, not just that you've, I mean, it's not just a question that you haven't sinned, but you've got to be intrinsically perfect and holy as well, because God can only have fellowship with people who are 100% holy. So, can you see that once man sinned, the barriers began to pile up? So, in order to have got to heaven under your own steam, not only would you never have had to have been guilty of any particular sin, but you would also have to have been intrinsically perfect in yourself, you see. So all these barriers piled up when Adam sinned against God. Now when Jesus died on the cross, he knocked every barrier away, and you get all the different aspects of the atonement. Like for instance, when Jesus died on the cross, he was the lamb sacrifice. That means <clears throat> that the sins were paid for, and they could be forgiven and forgotten by God. The sin was covered. And the word atone, if you get atonement, the general concept, it means to cover. When Jesus died on the cross, every sin that everyone has ever committed, past, present and future, and this applies for all the sins that are going to be committed by people who aren't born yet, all, right, all those sins were covered on the cross. But there are different aspects as well. Because we know, for instance, that we died in Jesus as well. You see, even if I could reach to the point where I never actually sinned, it doesn't change the fact that I've got a sinful nature. Now that's another barrier. Even if I never sinned, I've still got a sinful nature. That keeps me from God as well. And that's another thing that's between us. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, the entire human race was incorporated into his death. Therefore, as a Christian, I now realise that when Jesus died on the cross, I died there with him. And if I believe that and act on it, then my sinful nature will have no power over me, only the new nature created after the likeness of Jesus himself. So you see all these different aspects, and there are four or five. You begin to put them together, and you see that there are four or five specific barriers that were between man after Adam sinned. There were specific barriers between man and God. And on the cross, Jesus dealt with and disposed of and knocked down and totally destroyed each one of the barriers so that they are no longer there. Now therefore, picture with me <clears throat> that when Jesus died on the cross, the barrier has gone. But what we have now standing between us and God is Jesus himself. 
Jesus died on the cross and that barrier was removed by him 100%. He now stands where the barrier used to be. The barrier has gone. It's not there anymore in anyone's life. It's gone. But Jesus now stands between man and God. So before I became a Christian, there was no barrier of sin between me and God, but Jesus stood between me and God. In place of that barrier that Jesus had destroyed, Jesus stood in that place as well. Now you remember instead, now Jesus said, I am the door. So what we've got is that instead of the barrier that cannot be passed through, it's been taken away by Jesus. Jesus now stands there in its place. And whereas the barrier was unpassable, Jesus stands there as a door. And what is left is simply this. Before Jesus died on the cross, no matter how much you wanted to, you could not have got through that barrier. But once Jesus died, the barrier is gone and he stands there as an open door. Therefore, what is left now is simply for people to walk through Jesus as the door. Literally, to believe in Jesus. So therefore, can you see that if man is separated from God, there's only one sin that now does it, it's the sin of unbelief. Because the barrier is gone, Jesus stands there as the open door, and if anyone believes in Jesus, if anyone realises, if I die, I'm going to go to hell, alright, because I haven't got into fellowship with God. My goodness, I want to be in fellowship with God. Here is Jesus, he is the way, he is the door, I'm going to get into Jesus, I'm going to believe, and therefore I'm saved. So can you see that salvation is by faith, believing in Jesus? Fine, we'd all agree with that. But therefore condemnation is through unbelief not through sin unbelief itself is a sin but it's not the sin issue that's going to land people in a lake of fire it's simply that they have refused to act on the fact that Jesus has taken their sin away if they refuse to believe they can never enter into that salvation and that is why here Jesus says he who believes in him is not condemned why? Well look, picture, here's us of ourselves on this side, alright? I mean, say you've got two cliffs here and you've got a steep drop, okay? Here's us on our cliff, alright, separated from God, facing upon death the lake of fire. Here's the other cliff, alright, and if you stand on this cliff, it's eternal life. Now Jesus stands there as a bridge. Anyone is free to pass from one to the other. But the condition is that you go over that bridge because it's the only one there is. And even if these cliff edges run for five million miles each way, the point is there's only one tiny little bridge. And the only way across is across that bridge. Well, if someone uses that bridge, they're across. And they're saved because they believed in the bridge and they escaped. But people who remain and face hellfire they're not going to end up in the lake of fire because of their sin. Their sin was removed when Jesus died on the cross. They're going to end up in the lake of fire because they didn't believe in the bridge and therefore didn't use the bridge. All right. So this is why Jesus says, He who believes in him, i.e., he who believes in Jesus is not condemned. Why? Because if you believe in Jesus, you walk through him as a door. Remember, there is one God, and there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And in the Bible, in the Greek, if you go into it, it's not just a question of believing in Jesus, it's literally believing into Jesus. This whole, whole idea in the scripture that everything we have, we have in Jesus. And it's because when you go through the door, the door leads into Jesus himself. Um, I think I've said here before, when I was a little kid, a tot, uh, I used to love trains. And when mum used to go shopping, like after my brother went to school and I was left at home, and we'd go up shopping around the shops, and there was a station there, you know, the underground station, but a sort of overground section. And I used to love the trains. I'd be absolutely mad on the trains. And what I used to do sometimes is that there was a newsagent right on the corner where the station was. 
And as you went into the new, um, into the shop, you could just see if a train was coming in and the barrier was clear, you see. And if I saw a train that was coming in, what I'd do is I'd time it and I'd pull my hand out of mum's hand and I'd belt through the station, I'd jump onto the train before the door shut and I'd be in the train. And in fact, they, I mean, down here at Chigwell, they were always phoning my mum up. Yeah, if she lost me at the shops, she knew where to go, Chigwell Station, and there I'd be, you know, talking to the station master. Now, can you see, I was so into trains that I literally believed myself into the train. And once into the train, I went where the train went. Now, in exactly the same way, when you turn to Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, you're in him, and you go where Jesus goes. And Jesus goes to heaven. Jesus is and has eternal life, and we share it. So, therefore, he who believes in him is not condemned. The only reason that you end up saved is because you believed in Jesus. It's by faith. And that has been made a possible thing because when Jesus died on the cross, he became sin itself. He became the barrier of sin himself. He paid the price for sin. He was destroyed as sin and dealt with by God on the cross. All right, so sin was gone. But then he rose again from the dead and stood in the same place, but this time as an open door through which we could pass through. Therefore, people who end up condemned are only going to end up in the lake of fire for the simple reason, not that they're sinners, not that they're terrible people, but that they've refused to believe in Jesus and therefore have remained outside of salvation rather than go through Jesus as the door into salvation. Therefore, Jesus goes on to say, he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So can you see that because of the atonement, because Jesus himself became sin for us, the barrier has been removed. Not just for us who believe, but the barrier of sin in every non-Christian's life was dealt with when Jesus died on the cross. So sinners born today, people born today, do not have a barrier of sin in their life between them and God. What they do have is that Jesus stands between them and God and it's up to them whether they'll admit they need salvation and then believe in Jesus and walk through the door to salvation. Now if you turn over to John 14, there's another verse which shows this very, very clearly. Or is it John, John 16? 16 verse 9. Is it John 16 verse 9? That's right, yeah. And, and here's <coughs> Jesus talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I'll start reading um, from verse 7. And he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Counselor will not come to you. This is the Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, and now Jesus speaks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, he will convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So here we say, oh no, Beres, what you're saying is wrong. Because the Holy Spirit comes and he convicts people of sin, doesn't he? What you're saying is wrong. Well, let's move on. He says, of sin, because they do not believe in me. The only sin that prevents someone being saved is the sin of not believing in Jesus because they exclude themselves because they will not believe on Jesus and therefore they will not be saved. Now, what, you know, a good way to think of it is like this. Now, take someone like Hitler, all right, and I'm just picking his name out because, I mean, he is... You know, I mean, as far as sinners go, people say, <coughs> I mean, you can't get more <coughs> terrible than someone like Hitler. Now let me say that if before he died Hitler cried out to Jesus, we're going to meet him in heaven. All right? I don't know whether he did or not. I know that von Ribbentrop got saved. <coughs> and I think that's terrific. He got saved and we'll see him in heaven. But let's assume that Hitler is going to end up in the lake of fire. Now why is Hitler going to end up in the lake of fire? 
Is it because he murdered 6,000 Jews? 6 million Jews? No. Is it because he was such a terrible man? No. Hitler, if indeed he ends up in the lake of fire, will do so because he didn't believe in Jesus. Because once Jesus died on the cross, the barrier of sin was totally and 100% eradicated. On the cross, him who knew no sin was made to be sin. Can you see, Jesus himself became a personification of the barrier when he was on the cross. And the barrier of sin and the punishment that the sinfulness of man brings and all the individual sins that can be committed, all that was judged and taken out and dealt with in Jesus on the cross. The barrier was obliterated then. Not when we're converted, the barrier in everyone's life was obliterated when Jesus died on the cross. Now, instead of that unpassable barrier, there stands Jesus. Not as an unpassable barrier, but as an open door. We can see this by using another couple of terms as well. I expect you've heard about ransom and redemption. All right. Um, now, we talk about us being the redeemed of the Lord, don't we? Now, the idea in the Bible about ransom and redemption is that to redeem something, the word literally means to buy out of the slave market of sin. So what we've got is the picture that we are enslaved to our sinful natures. All right? So therefore, picture us, we are slaves in a slave market. All right? And a slavery, of course, can't buy his own freedom. So the whole point is that there is nothing we can do to get out of the mess that we're in. We are slaves. We'd love to be free. We'd love to be saved, if you like. But it doesn't change the fact that we are slaves, helpless to do anything about it. Now, one of the reasons why, I mean, some people, they put things down like the virgin birth as being, well, it hardly matters one way or the other. My goodness, it does. Because the virgin birth meant that Jesus did not have a sinful nature. Now what that means is that he comes into a world and everyone in the world, past, present and future, is in the slave market of sin. And a slave cannot buy his freedom. He must have a free man come and pay for him. So that he can then leave under the ownership of the free man who bought him. You can't have one slave go up to another and say, well look, I really want to help you, I really love you brother, I'm going to buy you out of this slave market. Because your slave, you know, the slave owners of the market, Satan, they're not going to have that, you see. You've got to be bought by a free man. So the whole point is that when Jesus came into the world, he came into the world as a free man, through the virgin birth, because he had no sinful nature. Therefore, Jesus could come into the world and legitimately say, I am entitled to buy any of these slaves that I want, and I'll pay for them. Now, the price was his life. The price was his blood. But the point is this. When Jesus died on the cross, his blood, because it was the blood of the eternal Son of God, is of infinite value. It's not like your blood, it's not by my blood. I mean, God spoke to Noah and he says that if a man sheds blood, by, you know, by a man shall his blood be shed. God puts great store on our lives. We are incredibly valuable. So valuable that God demands that if you kill me, if you murder me, you die. That's how valuable each one of us, the individual human life, is beyond value. And the reason why capital sort of punishment must be is because if you jail a man for murder, you've made murder robbery. Can you see what I mean? But the hum a human life is beyond price. You can rob someone of their money. You can rob someone of their car and you can put a price on it. But a human life is beyond price. Therefore, a murderer must die. Now, if that's the kind of value that is in our blood, my goodness, can you see the value of the blood of Jesus as the eternal Son of God? Now, the point being, when he died, he was then able to buy everyone 
in the slave market of sin. So picture Jesus, as it were, as a free man. He comes into the slave market. Now let's say that the entire population of the world, from Adam right up to the last man, whoever lives, all right, throughout time, let's say it's N million, all right, and the N is an undefined number. Now the point is, Jesus walks in and he sees these N million slaves, and he says, right, I'll pay for the lot. Everyone was bought and paid for by Jesus. Now that's what it means that Jesus came to give his life as a, as a ransom. Everyone, everyone in this earth, past, present and future, has been already paid for and bought out of the, the slave market of sin by Jesus. He paid the ransom for everyone past, present and future, regardless of whether they believe or whether they don't believe. Now therefore everyone is ransomed. Now when you get into the Greek it gets a little bit confusing. I won't go into the Greek and I'll make it as simple as I can. But the whole point is this, potentially everyone who has ever been born on this planet is redeemed. But the point is this, if you redeem something it's yours and you buy it back. Now everyone is Jesus's because he is the creator. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and that means everyone who has ever been born or whoever will be born. Now you redeem something by buying it back. Now the point is this, I mean say, say I have a gold watch and it ends up down the pawn shop for whatever reason, it was mine but now it's not mine in someone else's ownership as it were down the pawn shop now I can go and I can redeem it and I redeem it by paying the price now here's the thing when I pay the money to redeem it I ransom it I pay the price for it but redemption only happens when I receive back into my ownership what I've ransomed that is when redemption actually takes place. Now the point is, if I go and redeem a gold watch, a gold watch has no choice. I pay me money, it's automatically handed over into my ownership. I've redeemed it. Therefore, if you go into a pawn shop, the ransom and the redemption are one and the same act. But here, we're not talking about gold watches, we're talking about you and I. People. People created in the image of God and who therefore have free will. Now what's happened is this. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he bought back, he paid the price for, he ransomed everyone. Regardless of whether they repent, regardless of their response, he ransomed everyone. But the point is, having ransomed everyone, he then said, I bought you, you are free to leave the slave market of sin. But, because the object's ransomed, human beings have got free will. Therefore, they can stay in the slave market of sin if they want to. So, whereas they've been bought and paid for, Nevertheless, they can stay outside of that. And the point is that if one slave says, not interested, I like it here. Or if another slave says, what? Someone has paid for me to be free. Don't believe it. Can you see, those people, they're paid for, the door is open, but they remain as slaves. But when you get a slave who says, great, and he walks out of the slave market of sin under the ownership of Jesus. Can you see that although everyone has been ransomed or paid for, it's those who come out into the ownership of Jesus, the one who's paid the price, they are actually redeemed. Can you see what I'm saying? Therefore, everyone, the whole world, is, is bought by Jesus. Everyone has been paid for they can come out of the slavery of sin. How? Just by believing they can. Just by believing that Jesus has done it. But the redeemed of the Lord are those who actually respond and believe in Jesus. Now that's why when you go through the scriptures, 
When you get phrases like ransomed or bought or stuff like that, you'll find that applies to everyone. But when you get the word redeem, that only applies to believers. Can you see, what I'm saying is, if I go into a pawn shop, I ransom it, and it's redeemed automatically. But in this instance, because we're talking about people with free will, you can be ransomed and therefore redeemed, but you're only actually redeemed if you respond to it. Mm. This is the whole point about it. Now, having said that, let me just, as a sidelight, uh, just uh, turn to, you turn to Peter, and it's to Peter. And um, I was talking about eternal security of fellowship the other day, and um, a verse came up that uh, people quote to say that you can lose your salvation. And what I've said now solves the problem <coughs> for us. And, um, and it's simply this. If you read in 2 Peter, chapter 2, now at the end of the verse, it's clear that these people that Paul, that the people that Peter talks about at the beginning of verse 2, chapter 2, at the end of chapter 2, he goes on and says very clearly that they're lost. All right, that they're not saved. Now, what throws people is this. They say that these men are Christians who lose their salvation. Now then, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers amongst you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. And what people say is, but look, these men, they're bought by Jesus. They're Christians. No, they're not Christians, because everyone is bought for by Jesus. Can you see what I'm saying? It's only those who have responded and believed and been saved who are actually redeemed. Every Your sins are a problem, but not in salvation sense, but in the sense of in relating to Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and being close to your brothers and sisters in the family. So for that reason, we undergo the discipline of the Lord. And when we sin, we need to repent of that. When we sin, we need to put it right with God and with each other, if we've sinned against each other. But this has got nothing at all to do with whether or not you're saved. Now let's say, for instance, that someone gets converted. And let's take King Saul in the Old Testament, because, I mean, he believed on the Lord, he got born again, and, and in a very long Christian life he spent 90% of it out of fellowship with God. And it got so bad that eventually he was, in John it talks about the sin unto death, in the epistle of John. And Saul was an example of the sin unto death. God said, I can't get any joy out of you, you better come home. So God knocked him off, which is the final discipline. God can't get anywhere with you. You know, I mean, you've got to be pretty bad before you get there, like, like Saul. But the point was, here's the classic example of the Christian life gone wrong. A rebellious son, a rebellious Christian. Now, the thing is, all right, he gets converted, all right, and then he lives a dreadful Christian life, or practically all of it, out of fellowship with God. You see, what happened when he died? Well, what you've got to remember is, you see, his sins, like everyone else's, were paid for when Jesus died on the cross. Therefore, his sins are not separating him from God in any salvation sense. And once he died anyway, because he was in Christ, he gets a new nature. His body dies, and with it the sinful nature. All that's left is the soul after the image of Jesus, and he's with the Lord. You see, I mean, there's no punishment because he lived out of fellowship with God. He'll lose out at the judgment seat of Christ, he won't get quite so many rewards as he could have done if he'd been in fellowship. But the point is, when he dies, you see, because his sin was dealt with on the cross, it's not a barrier at all. But what we're concerned is that having been set free from the penalty of sin, that we go on with the Lord and let him deal with the power of sin in our lives. And again, you'll find, on what basis does that happen? We've already seen that salvation, all right, has to come about because man sinned and there was the barrier of sin between him and God. So Jesus died, smashed the back, became the barrier, all right? Jesus died, the barrier smashed, and all that is now there between an 
unrepentant sinner and God is Jesus as an open door and if the unbeliever believes he goes through and he's in the kingdom born again as simple as that so now the barrier that you and I face or we think we face as Christians is that we've got a sinful nature now what is the answer to this and this is where it's so glorious I think this phone calls for me but I've got to finish this bit first um, the point is that the barrier that we think is there now is our sinful nature and in the same way that people say that someone who's not saved the barrier between them and God is sin it's not that barrier was dealt with all they do is believe that the barrier is not there anymore because of Jesus and they're through now for you and I the barrier that we think we face as Christians is our sinful nature now then is it a barrier the answer is no it's not a barrier because when Jesus died on the cross we died there with him our sinful natures went on the cross with Jesus and can you see in regards to being set free from the power of sin in our lives what stands between us and a victorious Christian life I'll tell you not a barrier but Jesus Jesus and if we believe that we have victory then indeed we have it so can you see salvation is by faith because on the cross Jesus took the barrier sin away and instead of that barrier there's Jesus you believe and go through so for us as Christians the barrier that we think is there is the sinful nature it's not because it was nailed to the cross when Jesus died the barrier is gone all that stands there now is Jesus himself and if we but believe it we go through it and experience it so the whole point is that every barrier between God and man be it unbelievers or believers has been gone the only thing that prevents us knowing the victory and experiencing it is if for any reason we say I don't believe it or I'm not going through and indeed for Christians it could well be that someone says well okay I could have victory but I don't because I like my life the way it is but okay then they're not going to go through are they they're not going to experience it they're going to stay out of fellowship with God but the whole point is when Jesus died on the cross can you see the sin issue was dealt with it was smashed once and for all therefore salvation from the penalty of sin is by faith and also for us salvation continuously from the power of sin is by faith sanctification is by faith the same as justification is as well so the barrier has been dealt with so therefore sin yes terrible but when we understand it's been dealt with it doesn't make sin any less terrible but for us it makes sin something that victory over is totally viable because Jesus has done everything that's needed for it uh, they, they off as soon as I, um, I answered, so oh, I see. I'll oh, perhaps that is right. <coughs> uh, right. Does that is that clear? Yeah. I think. Uh, don't you think a lot of Christians have dropped away from the churches because, through lack of wrong teaching, they've been made more sin conscious than uh, righteous conscious? Yeah. Yeah. I can see what you mean. Uh, I mean there's a sense in which a deeper sin consciousness is something that the Holy Spirit brings but not in any sense of condemnation simply that the more you realize your proneness to sin the closer you'll stay to Jesus as the one who can save you from it at any one moment therefore to be aware of our sinfulness is a good thing but only insofar as that awareness of our sinfulness goes hand in hand with the awareness of our oneness with Jesus and therefore our victory over it when God looks down upon us he doesn't see our sinfulness why doesn't he see our sinfulness well the reason is because God sees things as they really are and if my sin along with everyone else's was destroyed and dealt with at the cross by Jesus well then God can't see it can you see what I mean because it was dealt with by Jesus and if my sinful nature went to the cross with Jesus when father looks down upon me what does he see he sees what I call the BJ Jesus version now I need that awareness of my sin knowing that if I operate 
in any other way apart from faith. Remember, what I'm saying is that if I'm to know victory from sin, there's only one way by believing that Jesus has got it for me. Simple as that. Not trying, not struggling, but finally believing that Jesus has got it from me. Therefore, my trust has got to be 100% in Jesus. I need to know that it's only something he does through me. It's not something I can do. Therefore, what the Holy Spirit needs to do is to prevent me living in my own strength. Therefore, can you see we need to know the sinfulness of our hearts? Because it's that which prevents us living in our strength. Now, can I just um, ask you about this but now? On 1 John, you know, 1 John 1, yeah. 8 and 9, right. where John is obviously talking to Christians, if we <coughs> say that we have no sin, that we deceive right. ourselves, you know, right. and if we confess our sins, he's obviously talking to Christians. That's right. I, I, I'm thrilled by what you've said tonight, but I just want to see where those two slot in, those verses now. Yeah, right. Now, what we've said, basically, is that because of what Jesus has done, firstly, for unbelievers, there's no need for them ever to go to Lake of Fire because they can believe on Jesus and be saved. And we've said also that for you and I, as people who have taken that step, what we are saying is because of what Jesus did on the cross, we need not sin. Now, if I say that, I'm saying totally on 100% what the Bible says. We need not sin. But remember, that we need not sin, but that victory over sin is by faith. As we fully believe on Jesus and rest in him, of course we will not sin. But the point is, we still have a sinful nature inside of us. It's not obliterated, so it's gone. In Romans 6, Paul talks about our sinful natures, and he said that they were destroyed on the cross. All right? Now that word destroy, the Greek word doesn't quite mean to destroy. It's a Greek word katagio, and it means to bring to nothing. Uh, the best way to think about it is if you've got acid. What is it? Neutralize, that's the word. Yeah. You never think of that word, yeah. Yeah, it means to neutralize. Therefore, say that my sinful nature is there and it's a bottle of acid, and it stings, it's potent, it's dangerous. Now, if I neutralise it with alkali, I pour it in, all right? Now, the acid is still there. Nothing's changed. The acid is there, but it's now neutralised and it's harmless. It doesn't operate as acid because it's been neutralised by alkali. Now then, if I was to extract the alkali, the acid is there, the same as it ever was, ready to strike because it's dangerous. Now. What we see is this, we are one with Jesus, and we're one with Jesus in his death as well. Now this means that if I live by faith in Jesus, if I live on the basis of my oneness with him, to the extent that I simply accept that my sinful nature was dealt with by Jesus on the cross, then Jesus is the alkaline for my sinful nature. Can you see it's neutralised? But to the extent I don't believe, the acid is active. In fact, it's more than that. You could have victory, you could have had that neutralizing effect of Jesus in one part of your life, but the acid remains, you know, absolutely in a different part of your life. Now, the point is that we have this sinful nature and evil heart of unbelief. Now, the potential for sinlessness, now, what I mean by that, the potential for victory over every temptation is there. But it can only be realized if perfect faith is there. And perfect faith is what we don't have. We must strive for it. I mean, I don't adhere to the doctrine of getting to a point where you never sin. Well, no, I haven't experienced that yet. But I hope it's true. And if I die having not realised it in this life, I won't mind because, of course, the minute I die, I get it anyway. Because the minute I die, I am sinlessly perfect because my sinful nature is then not neutralised, it is totally destroyed with my body. So what John is writing here, and 
this is the very kind of emphasis that he puts on it because he says um, now let's let's go through it um, let's let's start in chapter one and uh, verse verse B yeah, start with verse 8 if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us now why he's saying that is because remember on the cross and as we live in our oneness with Jesus our sinful nature is neutralized not obliterated it's neutralized at any moment it will spring back into life anything you do that is you rather than responding to what Jesus is doing by faith the sinful nature will come out so he's saying this because he says look don't get the idea that you're beyond sin because your sinful nature is there ready to strike the minute you take your eyes off of Jesus in any area of your life so then he goes on to say if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us etc etc now then let's let's go down into chapter 2 and he says my little children I am writing this to you so that you may not sin can you see John is advocating that we don't sin because he knows because he's a Bible believing Christian he knows that we don't have to can you see that full victory over sin has been provided for in Jesus so John knows that we do not need to sin all right but he goes on to say but if anyone does sin you see he believes both he knows that there is no need to sin but because he knows himself and presumably everyone in his church he knows that even though we don't have to sin we do sin so he then goes on to say but if we do we have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous and he is the expiation for our sins now listen to this and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world yeah. which includes unbelievers Jesus has dealt with their sins as well but it's purely whether or not you're willing to enter into that now let me end just by as we've come on to this verse let's let's get the whole gist of it because he says right you don't have to sin okay but he says you will and he says and when you do realize all right that you have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous now this word advocate if I tell you what it is in Greek you'll recognize it all right it's parakletos and it's exactly the same Greek word used for the Holy Spirit being the comforter you see parakletos comforter and advocate are exactly they're from the same Greek word and it this really means a defense lawyer that is what the Holy Spirit is to us a defense lawyer now remember that when Jesus was on earth physically he was the defense lawyer he was the one who was there to get the disciples out of trouble alright now he says I'm going back to heaven but another comforter is going to come alright and that is another the word is alos and it means another of exactly the same kind all right exactly so what Jesus is saying yeah I'm going to return to you but I'm going to return to you in the person of the Holy Spirit and he will be your defense lawyer on earth from now on but Jesus was going to heaven because Jesus is going to be our advocate our comforter our defense lawyer in heaven and it's it's good to know how this works because this is going on all the time um, it's quite whimsical actually I, I laugh at this but it's good to know what, what goes on every time you confess a sin remember if you sin you're out of fellowship with God All right, that's no problem because you can confess it and you're back into fellowship but know that when you're out of fellowship with God if you've sinned you're out of fellowship with God but what I want to show you is what happens in heaven when you confess your sins <coughs> and it might help you to understand why it says there's joy amongst the angels when a sinner repents that doesn't just kind of apply to when someone gets converted but it applies to us daily and one of the reasons maybe that there's joy in heaven is because the angels are literally splitting their sides laughing at what's happening with the devil up there and I'll try and paint the picture you see Satan is the accuser of the brethren now Satan probably doubtless spends most of his time in heaven get rid of the idea 
that Satan has been cast down to earth. He hasn't yet. That happens during the tribulation. That's a different thing. I can't go into that now. You'll remember, if you read in the book of Job, that Satan was before God in heaven. All right? And uh, God says, where have you been? He says, I've been walking to and fro across the earth. And that's the sort of idiom for I've been at home. You see, Satan owns this world. All right? But he was free in the time of Job to present himself to God, the Father. And we know he's the accuser of the brethren. Now, if you turn to Zechariah, we'll see that in the old, uh, the, towards the end of the Old Testament, this was still going on. And I'll read a few verses from Zechariah. And it's Zechariah chapter 3. Now, there is no teaching in the New Testament at all to suggest that it's any different today than it was then. All right? It will be in the tribulation when Satan and the demons are cast down to earth and they're kicked out of heaven and there's a final battle up there. But, listen to this. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest. Now, this isn't the Joshua who went into the promised land, all right? It's the high priest of the day. Right. Zechariah 3. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. This is what Satan means. It means the accuser. It's what Satan's name means. The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord rebuke you. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. All right, there's the sin. But the angel said to those who were standing before him, "Remove the filthy garments." And in actual fact, literally, that's vomit-filled garments. And you know, the um, in the I can't remember where it is in the old um, in the Old Testament, but man's righteousness to God is as dirty rags. Well, the Hebrew means vomit-filled. That's that's literally what it means: vomit-filled rags. Oh. Remove the vomit-filled garments from him. And he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with rich apparel. Then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. Now then, what we've got here simply is that Satan is in heaven, all right, and he's picking on Joshua, the high priest, okay, and Satan is there accusing. But all we see happening, we notice that no one is taking the blindest bit of notice about Satan, you know, of Satan here. All that happens is the filthy garments, the sin, and remember when Satan accuses you of sin, he's probably right. Alright? I mean I'm sure he makes some up, <coughs> but he doesn't have to do that very much. I mean I wouldn't imagine Satan has to make too many sins up to accuse me of, because all he's got to do is look. But the point is, there's him busy accusing, but Joshua, boom, the sin goes and righteousness in its place. Why? Because he's a believer. The sin problem has been dealt with. He's a believer. Now the whole point is that Jesus is our advocate, our defence lawyer in heaven. Now what happens is that God the Father is the judge. He's the judge of the whole earth. But what you've got to remember is that sin was judged on by sin was judged by God in Jesus, alright, so the judgment has already passed the final great white throne judgment is simply whether they believed in Jesus or not, alright, but the sin judgment is passed, it was put on Jesus, and because we're Christians uh, you know, we have entered into that salvation so picture that I sin, alright therefore what's happening in heaven is this Satan's up there like a rocket, alright and he steps before the bar, okay? There's God the Father as the judge. And he steps before the bar because one of God's children has sinned and God must judge sin, all right? So Satan's there and he is going to try and accuse me. Now what happens is this. As soon as I confess my sin, all right, Satan, Satan is there as the prosecuting lawyer and he's standing before God the Father, the judge, and Jesus is there as my defence attorney. Now remember that what happened was, when we saw in Zechariah, that basically the Lord told Satan to shut up. So what happens is, Satan comes in and he reads the charges, but I've confessed my sin, so therefore Jesus dashes up to the Father, 
And he says, Father, he's covered with my blood. Father, he's one of mine. All right, you gave him to me. He's one of mine. He's covered with the blood. All right. At this point, Satan moves in. He's got the charges. All right. He prepares to speak. He's checked all his facts. He knows that I actually sinned. There's no doubt about it. He's got witnesses. God isn't going to tell him I didn't sin because Satan knows that I did sin. So Satan moves into the court. He opens his mouth to accuse me. The judge, because this is a very biased law court, the judge tells him to shut up, <laughs> all right, and boots him out. Jesus, my defense lawyer, moves up to the father and he says, wait a minute, he's covered by the blood. Therefore, the father says, well, there, can there be any charge against God's elect? All right, no charges. Say, clear out, there's no charges. Now, the charges are true. I have sinned. But God says, there's no charge, this guy is elect, he's in Jesus, he's my son, no problem. What we all here for anyway, court adjourned. Can you see, that's what's happening. Because the minute I sin and repent and confess that sin, Jesus steps in, boots Satan out, there's no prosecution in the courts of heaven for us if we're believers, and the whole case is adjourned. And that, you know, sort of rather than the filthy rags, which my sin really is, I come out of it with robes of righteousness and a clean turban on my head, you see. So well, that while we've sinned, we're, we're, we're in filthy garments, as it were. We've kind of spoiled the, the, the holiness and righteousness of our standing. And we're out of fellowship with God. Yeah, but that's... At the moment, we, we say sorry. Well, yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, I'm dressed in the robes of righteousness to use the cliche I mean I'm washed in the blood of the lamb I am whiter than snow mm. and in God's eyes from the salvation point of view from the lake of fire that never changes mm. I mean if I die tonight it doesn't matter how many unconfessed sins there are in my life I might have been out of fellowship for 50 years like yeah. Saul was yeah. but the point is that I am washed in the blood of the lamb to use yeah. the cliche I am clean I am clean. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he gives us a picture of this. And he said, you are already made clean by the word I have spoken to you. Oh. You remember, he said to Peter, you know, I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter said, no, 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 Lord, you can't do that. You can't do that. And then Jesus said, but if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. So then Peter says, well, Lord, let's have a bath, you know, do my yeah. hands and, yeah. and the rest of me as well, you see, over the top. But Jesus says to him, he says, no, you are already made clean by the word I have spoken. What's he saying? You're born again. You've believed on me. The sin issue in your life is dealt with. You are clean. But the point is, day by day we walk in the world and our feet get dirty. The world rubs off on us. Therefore, it has to be washed. It's a picture of confession. So the point is that if you don't wash your feet, I mean, you know, sort of real, I mean, some Christians, their Christian lives can be compared to someone who hasn't washed their feet for 10 years, and then they wonder why Father isn't here talking to them, <laughs> you see. Now, the whole thing is that as a Christian, when you sin, you get out of fellowship with God. Confession, and Jesus washes your feet. Isn't that lovely? He washes you, he doesn't tell you off, he washes your feet, you see. <clears throat> but if we don't confess that sin, then we're out of fellowship with God in a relationship sense, and rather than enjoying blessing, we come under the discipline of the Lord. But it's the discipline of a father and a son, all right? It's not the judgment of a holy God to a sinner, because that judgment is past. Isn't there something in the, in the New Testament about the, the garment spotted by the flesh or something? That's right, yeah, that's James, isn't it? Oh, James, James 5, yeah. I believe. Does that mean the garments of righteousness that get spotted? Uh, Let's just have um. I've lost James, right, here we are. And it's talking about a brother. Let's see if I can find it. Is it James or is it somewhere else? I've just looked very quickly. Is it quickly. Not Rebel, uh, Rebel, Rebel not Revelation. Um, oh, I can't find it. It's garments, is it? It is garments. Um, yeah. 
Yes, it's it's a letter of Jude, and uh, it's verse verse 22, and it says, "Convince some who doubt, save some by snatching them out of the fire. On some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh." Um, it will be a bit difficult actually to work out whether no it's in Jude it's in Jude hating even the garment spotted by the flesh what verse? Uh, verse 23 there's one in James 5.2 well let's have a look at that one your garments are mothy oh no yes that's that's about the um now that's about the Christians who are trusting in riches and exploiting people. Revelation have not defiled their garments in Revelation, Johnson. I think that in Jude, what it's talking about here <coughs> is is that um, that probably if if you go through the context, I think this is talking about non-Christians anyway, isn't it? Um, the context of it in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions ah. and I think that the context there it talks about convince some who doubt to convince is to persuade and Paul says we persuade men oh. and save some by snatching them out of the fire which is of course if you lead someone to Christ you do that um, so I think this thing hating even the garment spotted by the flesh it couldn't refer to the robe of righteousness that we have as believers because it says hating even yeah. the garment yeah. spotted by the flesh yeah. so I think that what he's saying here is he's saying look hate everything that's to do with sin yeah, well, can you well, say? yeah I can understand that um, it's a contradiction in terms if, if a, a, a robe of righteousness could ever be Possibly mm. spotted. Yeah, that's right. It's, um, it's, it's a pretty. <laughs> yeah. It's there's, it? yeah. Right. there's just one other thing that I'll read in Romans 7. And this really is quite. It's one of these verses that is quite amazing. I mean, I haven't really taken in the full extent of what it means, although I think you can get an idea. But you see, what we're saying is how totally thorough is the death of Jesus. All right, how totally 100% thorough is the death of Jesus and also how 100% thorough is the new nature that you and I have as born again believers made in the image of Jesus because um, in Colossians it speaks about uh, he says put on the new nature created after the image of Jesus so what he's saying is when you got born again and the Holy Spirit came into you a new you the you who would have existed had you never been born in sin was born through the power of Jesus you were born again there was a new you so there's an old you a sin you and there's a new you a Jesus version of you can you see what I'm getting at now when Paul talks about in Romans 7 he talks about the struggle that he had that he really wanted to obey God's law but he couldn't it didn't matter how much he wanted to, he couldn't. Every time he got the chance to do right, he did wrong. And he couldn't help it. And every time he really determined that he wouldn't do something, he did it, you see. And yet he, he delighted in the law, in my inward man, he says. But, you know, he says, I, I just can't do it. Now, let me see if I can um, find the bit that I want. Yes. I'll just read from verse 13, no I won't, from verse, verse 15. He says, I do not understand my own actions. Now remember, he's a born again believer. Some people try to say that this is the struggle he went through before he was converted. It's not. This is the struggle he went through because he got converted. And he says, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. Because he's saying, well look, I'm agreeing with God's law because I know it's wrong what I'm doing. I hate it because it's wrong. He says, now, so then, and this is the verse, it's incredible. So then, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. Now can you begin to see the kind of, just how far that verse is going? 
Mm. In verse 20, he says, Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. He says mm. it again. Oh. Now, this is almost amazing, because it's as if Paul is trying to draw a distinction and he's saying that once you're born again you must distinguish between you and your sin and he's saying that sin in you now exists quite separate from you you see the point is that when you were born again you were brought into oneness with Jesus you are one with Jesus Jesus is the vine we are the branches now if I took you to a vineyard and I pointed to a branch and I said what's that you would say it's a vine do you see what I mean because the branches are the vine therefore when Jesus says I'm the vine you are the branches the branches aren't separate from the vine the branches are the vine they're as much the vine as the root they're as much the vine as the stem therefore this oneness we have with Jesus is absolutely total which means when if any man is in Christ he is a new, crea uh, a new creation therefore when you were born again a totally new you came into being what happened you were brought into oneness with Christ now try and picture what your life would have been had Adam and Eve not sinned picture that sin never came into the world therefore you would not have had a sinful nature now that is what Jesus has done for us on the cross do you see what I mean? do you see what I'm getting at? now a new me is born and it's the me that there would have been had I never ever been touched or tainted by sin and this is made possible because Jesus who is the only one who has freedom from sin he is one with me and I can share in his very freedom from sin which means now there's two me's alright there's the BJ fallen version alright <laughs> now the trouble with him wasn't BJ it was his sin alright I've said this before there's nothing wrong with you except your sin but when I got born again <coughs> God took this BJ and a new version this time the real BJ what I always should have been but was prevented from being because Adam sinned can you see what I mean because the devil's in the world so the new BJ a Jesus version of BJ now what Paul is saying here is that our oneness with Jesus is so totally thorough it's almost as if you can say that when you sin you haven't sinned but it's simply the residue of sin <coughs> that remains in your Christian body now one has to be careful alright because one could take that too far and say well I mean it's not my fault I'm not I can't help it's just my <laughs> sin you see and you could disclaim responsibility that isn't what Paul's doing because Paul himself is the first one to urge people to repent mm. but what he's just trying to do is to show how thorough how total how complete our oneness with Jesus is and he's almost saying and when sin slips through or by virtue of you being one with Jesus it's not you anyway it's just your sin but you must take that in balance because we won't want to be going around saying well I can sin because it, it's not my fault so but it's the